Welcome, everybody, to a special crossover edition of the Locked On Predators and Locked On Blackhawks podcast. Thanks for making us your first listen today. You can catch both shows as part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, I am Nick Morgan from the Locked On Predators podcast, joined by Jack Bushman from Locked On Blackhawks. Jack, good to have you, man. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, it must mean hockey season's starting to get here pretty close. I know uh, both our teams have some interesting things going on in the last few months, and we were talking before the show. We're both excited to finally see our teams on the ice and have a little more concrete news to cover. So yeah. uh, excited that the season is closed in here, and thanks for having me, Nick. How are you doing today? Doing good, man. I'm with you. Like, thank God the uh, the the period of speculation and kind of what about is over. We finally have some actual on ice stuff to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about the changes for both of our teams, plus maybe a realistic expectation for the Preds and Blackhawks this year. Uh, but Jack, I would be remiss if I didn't start uh, by asking about the big move that the entire NHL has been talking about. Of course, the big addition from NHL draft weekend in Nashville, the first overall pick, just electric score. I'm talking, of course, about Taylor Hall to Chicago, man. <laughs> this is this is the guy. This is the guy that's going to turn the franchise around. Everybody just can't wait to see Taylor Hall on the ice for the Blackhawks. Hey, he's the former MVP, man. Don't he sleep is. on him. He is. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, of course, Connor Bedard. Uh, the headline for Chicago. And it will, I will say we will go back to Taylor Hall because I feel like some of these other additions uh, have been, uh, you know, definitely want to talk about them too because they're certainly interesting from the Blackhawks perspective. But let, let's talk about Connor Bedard because this is the guy, I think when, as soon as we figured out the Blackhawks, we're going to have the number one overall pick. Everybody said, all right, like, you know, the, the march towards contention, uh, is on like this is the guy this is gonna be the you know the franchise player for 20 years uh his first impressions you know through camp through rookie camp what have you seen out of him so far yeah it's undoubtedly been very impressive and it's been nice to you know finally after all the months of all the hype and the excitement here in Chicago after getting him we finally got to see him on the ice a couple of weeks ago but I'll tell you what Nick even prior to that um, I've been really impressed with just how Connor Bedard has handled everything, right? All the media, all the buzz. And for being a kid that turned 18 years old just in July, he was drafted at 17 years old, you know. He's just incredibly mature and has handled everything remarkably well. And I think us Blackhawks fans who have gotten to know him understand, you know, obviously there's all this excitement about him being a special hockey player, but he really does seem like a very special person as well. And we heard a lot of good things from the front office about um, even just his leadership qualities and capabilities at their development camp over the summer as well, how uh, that was all off ice activities for the Blackhawks as well. But Kyle Davidson, Blackhawks general manager, pointed out how just other fellow prospects are already just clinging to him because he's just got this special thing about him, right? And mm -hmm. that's always what you want to hear about a kid, especially with these types of lofty expectations. That's going to be, you know, having a lot of pressure that comes with being considered a generational talent. So right from that and from everything I heard this summer, I was really impressed about the kid. Um, but his ability on the ice in the last week has been uh, on full display. And he had his little coming out party, I guess you could say, at the Tom Curvers Prospect Showcase a couple of weekends ago where the Blackhawks took on the Minnesota Wild Prospects one night um, on Sunday. And then on Saturday, the day before, they actually opened things up against the St. Louis Blues. That was the one game Bedard played in, and he was an absolute showstopper. And I said this on my show, it was almost like, he went out there with the full Conor McGregor mantra. He wasn't there to take part. He was there to take over. And Nick, he ended up with a hat trick, a primary assist in their 5 nothing victory. Uh, there wasn't an official stat keeper there, but he was credited with 11 shots on goal. And I'll tell you what, he might have had 20 to 25 shot attempts. <laughs> he was absolutely, utterly dominant. All three of his goals were highlight reel type goals. One was from down below the goal line where he picked top corner above the goalies shoulder the other was a sick curl and drag from the right dot that looks like a shot that not many guys in the NHL have right now so from all accounts man on the ice off the ice I've been incredibly impressed with Connor Bedard and I think even more so now us Blackhawks fans are saying man can't wait for this thing to start in two weeks and it really does look like we got a good one on our hands so he's checked off all the boxes that you've wanted to see thus far 
just continuing to progress, continuing to stay comfortable, establish some chemistry, and just hopefully stay healthy for as long as possible, man, because this kid's got the goods. It's pretty clear. Yeah, I bet the moment he hit that ice uh, in, in that 98 big red Chicago Blackhawks jersey, uh, you could kind of feel the excitement uh, from the Windy City all the way down here across the rest of the NHL. Uh, you know, you mentioned the expectations on, on Bedard. It's it's no secret that everybody's kind of been touting this guy as like the next big one, like the next McDavid, the next Crosby, you know, sort of the next generational talent. That's a lot of pressure uh, uh, for, you know, a, a, an 18 year old kid to carry. So the, the thing I love about what the Blackhawks did this summer, and we kind of alluded to it, it's sort of in a joking way off the top, but you know, they brought in Taylor Hall, they brought in Corey Perry, they brought in Nick Felino, a lot of veterans with a lot of experience. And you know, you, you combine that with Seth Jones and you know, somebody like Tyler Johnson, guys that have been in the NHL for a long time. It really seems to me that the Blackhawks are surrounding him with you know, guys that you know they still can play, but their main job is just kind of be sort of the leader by example, not just for Bedard, but for all the young players in the Blackhawks system. And to me, that's huge because I, I got to feel like that takes maybe some of the expectation, some of the pressure off Bedard's shoulders early on. Yeah. I really liked all three of those additions that the Blackhawks made. And this was something I've talked about in a couple crossovers too, is I thought Kyle Davidson um, with Taylor Hall and moves like that in particular, not so much Felino and Perry. I'll get to them in a second, but he's done a very good job of bringing in guys since he's taken over as GM of guys who could be coming in with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. And Taylor Hall obviously is a guy who's been there and done that in this league, but he's also someone who's trying to prove that he could still be a top six forward in this league as well. It's been quite a few seri- uh, quite a few seasons since. Uh, I joked off the top, you know, he's the one who won the MVP. It's been a few years since he was that type of player, and he's going to get a real true opportunity here in Chicago to probably play alongside Connor Bedard on that top line all season long. And quite honestly, that was a move the Blackhawks needed to make, not only to give Bedard maybe a veteran guy to play with as well, but looking at who the Blackhawks had on their roster prior to that move, not many true top six skill set types of guys. So I think it was smart in terms of adding a veteran and also adding someone who can keep up with Bedard. And then for Nick Felino and Corey Perry, two very smart veteran ads that aren't even they're They're going to help with Bedard, obviously, but this is a very young Blackhawks team. And there's going to be a lot of new faces coming up to the NHL level this year. And um, Corey Perry actually, was up in Montreal when Luke Richardson, Blackhawks coach, was the assistant there. And he spoke wonders about what Corey Perry did to help the development of guys like Nick Suzuki and Cole Caulfield. And Nick Foligno is another guy who's, you know, been there, done that, uh, had seen success at every level, been a part of good playoff runs, Um, and just a very respected guy. And he's already kind of earned his stripes here in Chicago, even though training camp hasn't been open for a week. Yeah, you can tell he just – brings that veteran presence. So just, yeah, a lot of smart moves that, you know, obviously a lot of people are wanting Bedard to to get developed in the proper way. And that's so important and probably is priority number one for the Blackhawks this year. But I think it's also a smart move for just kind of the position that this team is in as a whole, when they're still trying to turn the tides of this rebuild and kind of take that next step. It was important to bring in some leaders like that, some guys who have been part of good teams and knows what it takes to get the job done. So I, I really liked all the moves that Kyle Davidson did this off season to um, hi, help kind of round out the rest of this roster, Nick. Yeah. Another guy, Ryan Donato also, who had a very good year in Seattle last year. You know, you can, you can tell they're really uh, addressing depth. Uh, the one real quick, one thing I want to ask you, we obviously we, we've talked about Bedard. We know he's sort of the cornerstone. Is there anybody else, you know, on this team this year, maybe a young player, uh, who's not Connor Bedard that you see maybe ready to take that next step, maybe jump into the spotlight and play a bigger role this year. Nick, that's actually funny you say that because um, Blackhawks had a, a scrimmage down at their uh, facility today at Fifth Third Arena. And one player that we've seen a little bit of these last couple of years was 2020 first round pick Lucas Reichel. And in his first couple of NHL stints, he was a little tentative, a little caught in between on decisions and just didn't really find a lot of success. He had a lot of opportunities 
but didn't convert on a lot of them. And then the Blackhawks called him up late in the year for their final 16, 17 games. And it's like something flipped with him. The confidence just went up. The amount of assertion that he was bringing to the table, he started firing the puck more rather than just kind of banking on his playmaking abilities. And he became a real threat in transition and in the offensive zone. And it feels like that confidence has just built for him throughout this entire offseason because so far throughout camp, he was absolutely um, spectacular in those first couple of days. And in the scrimmage today, even on the ice with Connor Bedard, I, I know it's maybe a reach to say he'd be the best player, but Lucas Reichel was uh, the best player on the ice for the Blackhawks today. He scored two beautiful goals. Um, he's been playing with Andreas Athanasiu, who he played really well with at the end of last year as well. And if Lucas Reichel is playing with that amount of confidence and he's being that aggressive with the puck on his stick, I think he could be a real special player for the Blackhawks moving forward and could potentially be the second line center behind Connor Bedard. There's going to be a lot of guys getting that opportunity. Um, the Blackhawks have a pretty deep prospect pool, but I'll tell you what, Lucas Reichel sure as heck looks ready to make that next leap uh, in his first full season at the NHL level. Yeah, 15 points in 23 games, uh, you mentioned at the end of last year. Similar kind of stat line to a lot of the young Preds who came up at the end of last season. I feel like that's a pretty good subway be or seg segue. <laughs> Got sandwiches on my mind. I don't know. Uh, yeah, good segue to our next segment, which is a look at the Preds roster. Uh, because similar to Reichel, there are a lot of young players called up at the end of last year that really shone bright. So we're going to talk about that in just one second. But first, want to mention today's episode is brought to you by DoorDash. Uh, everybody has had this situation before. You go to the grocery store, you get everything you need for dinner, all your snacks, you come back home, you're ready to cook. Oh my God, you forgot an ingredient. And that's where DoorDash Grocery comes in handy. You trust a DoorDash to handle your restaurant favorites. Now you can get grocery delivery that delivers too. With thousands of grocery stores to choose from, you'll find the best in your neighborhood and boost your local economy with each and every order. You get exactly what you ordered or DoorDash will make it right. So sit back and enjoy quality groceries just like you picked them yourself. And if you want even more value, you can save on all your grocery and restaurant favorites with a $0 delivery fee on all eligible orders with a Dash Pass membership with easy substitutions right in the app and best-in-class customer support. DoorDash delivers groceries exactly like you want it. So get 50% off your first DoorDash order up to a $20 value when you lose use code LOCKED at checkout. Limited time offer, terms apply. Again, that's 50% off up to $20, no minimum subtotal, and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code LOCKED. Don't forget, that's code LOCKED at, for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. This is a special crossover edition of Locked On Predators and Locked On Blackhawks. Nick Morgan with Jack Bushman here. Uh, and Jack, you know, it's, it's not just the Blackhawks uh, who had an interesting offseason, but a lot of changes for the Nashville Predators as well. Yeah, I've been kind of really intrigued with the Nashville Predators this entire offseason because – it felt like, based on the moves that they made it towards the end of last season, they were starting to give, it feels like, some younger guys an opportunity. And they have had a, a fairly decent prospect pool these last few years, and they've had some success with guys stepping onto the scene. But then I, I don't want to say I was confused, but I thought it was interesting for them to go out and add veterans like Gustav Nyquist, Ryan O'Reilly, and Luke Shen. But I guess maybe kind of just talking even through that first segment, do you think the Predators had a, a similar mentality of wanting to put some more veterans around some of these guys after kind of shelling out the past era? Or what, what do you think was kind of the mindset behind the Nashville Predators offseason led by obviously new general manager Barry Trotz? They got a new head coach as well. What do you kind of make of all, all these moves and how do you kind of rate it? As yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with wanting to surround some of the younger players with veteran talent. And the one word that Barry Trotz used a lot this offseason, whenever he was describing move, like moves, whenever he was talking about uh, like what he wanted to do with the team, the word he used was culture. You know, he wants guys who not just play a certain way, but act a certain way. Like he really wants to fix the Predators from the locker room 
out. You know, he always mentioned, you know, he had a couple of cornerstones already in Roman Yossi, Philip Forsberg at UC Saros. He, you know, some even people like Ryan McDonough and Tyson Berry, who came at the end of last year, he wants to add to that. He wants, you know, veteran players who have cup experience, who've kind of been it all or, you know, done it all, seen it all in the NHL. So that's why he brought in Ryan O'Reilly, you know, somebody with that pedigree. Luke Shen, who's been a cup winner uh, on two different cup teams. Uh, somebody like Nyquist, who's competed in the playoffs. He wants those types of people on the team to kind of take the charge uh, of some of these younger players. And not just that, you know, not just kind of be like the locker room leader, but, you know, sort of lead by example on the ice as well. We have a young player by the name of Cody Glass, who last year showed makings of being a really good, you know, sort of two-way player. What better way to increase that than by watching Ryan O'Reilly, you know, maybe one of the three, four best defensive two-way centers in the game over the past 10 years. That's the kind of stuff, you know, it's not just, hey, you know, you're supposed to play like this, do this, you know, play, you know, kind of act like this in the locker room. Barry Trotz wants guys who are going to do that and show the young players how to do it by example. And I think that was, I think, the key not just to some of the additions, but the subtractions from the team as well this off season. And I did want to, one thing I've, I've noticed about the Nashville Predators, or at least from afar, so it seemed, it feels like they've always done a good job getting the most out of some of their guys, maybe in the bottom six, who some people aren't quite as familiar with, and then they wind up being pretty solid players. And you mentioned towards the ends of last year, uh, a lot of guys getting opportunities. Who are some of the players for us Blackhawks fans who might not be as familiar with the ins and outs of the roster that you expect to get those chances and maybe you're looking at to take a next step this season? Yeah, one name that I keep you know wanting to bring up is uh, Phil Tomasino. A lot of people have probably heard this name because he actually played a full NHL season two years ago as a 20-year-old in 2021-22, uh, had 31 points while mostly playing like 11, 12 minutes a game on the fourth line. That's pretty good. Situation kind of changed last year. He got sent back and played most of the year uh, in Milwaukee. He was called back up a pretty good like 20 game stint at the end of the season, uh, really kind of picked up the scoring where he left off was one of the guys that contributed a lot of points for the Nashville Predators after all the injuries and trades and stuff like that. This year is kind of the year that you're expecting him to, you know, Ann and I called it today, be the leader of the young guys like sort of be the veteran presence among all the youngsters that are trying to earn a roster spot in camp. Um, you know, he's, he's had experience playing, you know, with some of the Preds top liners. He's also um, played a lot, like just played a long playoff series for the Milwaukee Admirals. So he kind of was a leader for, you know, the minor league run and some of these younger players as well. So you know, he's got a really good, you know, eye for passing. Like he's just somebody you know, that makes, can make a seeing eye pass across the ice. And I look, I envision him playing somebody with, you know, Philip Forsberg, just a great pure finisher. If, if that happens, if Phil Tomasino can take the next step, like we think he's going to, the Preds got a very good playmaking winger to build around. And I wanted to ask you about Philip Forsberg as well. Funny enough, before uh, I kind of wanted to ask about your expectations, which we'll be doing to wrap things up. Philip Forsberg obviously missed over 30 games last year, but the season prior, the last full season that he had was the best one of his NHL career, where he was a point per game guy over that by a pretty good margin, um, a 40 goal scorer for the first time in his career, despite only reaching 30, I believe two times prior to that. Um, but it feels like moving forward now, he's going to be an even more integral piece of this Nashville Predators organization. And he's already been a pretty big key one for the last few years. What are you looking for in this bounce back season of his? Is there um, a, a certain aspect of his game you're looking to try to get back to? And do you think that he can still be um, a 35, 40 goal scorer, even though this kind of new core is here? I think he absolutely can. Um, and you sort of hinted on the big key is just for him to stay healthy. Like he has got to stay healthy. Injury concerns have kind of been a, a conversation with him, unfortunately, over, you know, the past five or six years. And it feels like that's really sort of undercut his momentum as a player. But the thing I love about Philip Forsberg, and you even saw this, you know, last year when the Preds struggled on offense 
when everything else looked like complete crap, like complete disaster, like a complete dumpster fire, Philip Forsberg was always the one guy on the ice that looked like he was just three gears above everybody else. Like when the Preds were struggling, he played mad and he would just, you know, take the puck off somebody's stick and just do it himself, you know, skate through three or four defenders, you know, check off somebody, you know, try to fight for the puck and, and get, you know, maybe the Preds best scoring chance of the game, you know, on the shift just by doing it himself. Now this year under Andrew Burnett's more, you know, sort of run and gun system, you know, just go for the net, just shoot for the net. That I think benefits a guy like Forsberg who can maybe create some of his own space and feels maybe more inclined to create plays for himself. Uh, you know, the, the word I use, maybe, maybe he's a little bit more selfish with the puck. Um, now that, you know, he doesn't have, you know, three veteran playmakers with him. Uh, so, you know, if, if that's kind of the style of play that he's going to play with, I, I think we can see a really big year for Philip Forsberg, even if the rest of the depth around Nashville is not quite there yet. Great point that you bring up that I didn't even really bring into account is Andrew Burnett and certainly the offense that he had in his last year as a head coach down in Florida probably means good things for Philip Forsberg and his shoot first style. Yeah, uh, that's, that's the hope. Anyway, uh, what, what we've seen uh, so far in camp is a good sign. Uh, not great start to the preseason on Monday night. Uh, the Preds scored exactly uh, just 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 one goal <laughs> and, uh, in the back to back games that they played against Florida. So hopefully that'll change. But Jack, you mentioned expectations. Uh, that's a big topic of conversation, not just the Preds, but for the Blackhawks as well. So I want to get into that. Uh, in just one second. But first, I want to remind everybody that Locked On Predators and Locked On Blackhawks are your free daily podcasts on the Predators and Blackhawks. You can find us both wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked On Predators or Locked On Blackhawks and hit that subscribe button so you'll always know when we have fresh content out for you. All right, Jack, we are talking about expectations uh, for these two teams. Uh, you know, even with Connor Bedard, even with some of the veterans uh, that the Blackhawks have brought in, a lot of people still have the Blackhawks there just anchored at the bottom of the Central Division predictions this year. Well, what's your thought? Do you, do you still think it's going to kind of be, you know, a continuation of a rough year, maybe another lottery year? Or do you think maybe there are there's a there's a chance that Blackhawks might surprise some people this year? I, I do think there there is a chance that they could surprise people, but I still think their their ceiling is capped at this point in time. And the way that I've kind of described it, Nick, is a runway year because even though we landed generational talent, Connor Bedard, hockey's not basketball. You need to put together a really good team in order to win the ultimate goal. And we're still thinking long-term here and we're still thinking ultimate goal. We want to open up our competitive window for as long as possible to be able to gear up for as many runs as we can. Once again, that's the whole point of this rebuild. And quite honestly, the Blackhawks are just still too early to truly go for it. And that's why we didn't see general manager, Kyle Davidson spend all of their cap space that we have this summer. It's because we realize we're still being a little bit patient here and, and there's no rush alongside things. And one thing I will point out, while I do think the Blackhawks offense should be better with Bedard and, and Taylor Hall, and you mentioned Donato and Felino and Perry, just adding some veteran guys and also a little bit of sandpaper in there as well. It's still going to be a pretty young defense, especially on the left side for the Blackhawks. We could be seeing three kind of first year full-time NHL players potentially. And then they're still having the duo of Peter Morazic and Arvid Soderbloom in that. So there are still some flaws with this team, certainly. But again, this isn't a year where the Blackhawks are trying to win just yet. They're trying to figure out what, what does Connor Bedard have? What does Lucas Reichel look like now that this is his third year in North America, first year full-time NHL or Kevin Korchinski is someone who's pushing for the team this year. Seventh overall pick from a year ago. We have two other young defensemen on the left side and Wyatt Kaiser, Alex Vlasic. We're still figuring out exactly what they are and exactly if they can be puzzle pieces. So this is just kind of a, a year where we're all 
Blackhawks fans front office, we're all kind of learning together about exactly what this next step needs to be. What additions do we still need to make? What do we need to go out and add? So I don't expect it to be much of a difference in terms of wins or standing position from last year. I do think they will be better, but I don't think they have a deep enough squad, particularly um, at, at the back two pairings and in that in order to be winning competitively or be thinking about playoffs. But we're going to learn a lot along the way, and this should be a season uh, that sets the Blackhawks up and allows their front office to figure out, okay, where do we go from here? And honestly, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. Yeah, I, I don't see anybody uh, being upset with another maybe top five uh, pick this year either, especially with the pipeline. The Blackhawks already have uh, Kevin. You mentioned Kevin Korch- Korchinski, uh, one of my favorite prospects uh, to watch. Like he is just really fun to watch. I think an underrated player. I I'm not kidding you, Nick. I've said this on my show. I, I've never seen a skater like him in person. The way that that yeah. kid can glide. It, it's absolutely incredible. And we're very excited for him to step onto the scene in Chicago, whether that's this year or whether that's next year. Yeah, uh, it's going to be fun uh, when he does because it feels like that's that's somebody that can be a franchise uh, blue line to go on with the fl- uh, franchise center. Uh, it's kind of you know interesting that you describe the Blackhawks. Let's just kind of see what we have here. That that kind of feels like the expectation in Nashville a little bit too. You look at the roster. Um, you know, the, you have a lot of these young players coming up into the fold this year, trying to win a spot. It's also interesting that Barry Trotz brought back a lot of familiar faces. Like he brought back Alexander Carrier and Dante Fabro both on one year deals. He brought back some veterans like Michael McCarron and Cole Smith back on one year deals. Yakov Trenin has one year left on his deal. Tyson Berry, one year left on his deal. It kind of feels like almost like, remember like back when American Idol. Uh, was a big thing and like the oh, yeah. first couple episodes were just like the auditions uh and then if you made it if you made it to hollywood there's always like this one or two shows where they like cut the auditions down to like okay here's our top 20 that kind of feels like the nashville predators season is there you're the barry trotz has invited everyone to hollywood we're sort of in like episode three and four where we're really trying to nail down okay who's really gonna compete that, that kind of seems like where the Nashville Predators are. Like you, you've brought back people you liked. You brought back people who have played a role on this team before. And you're trying to mix in some younger players on this team as well. To me, the, the goal of Nashville Predators this year, I think, is just for Barry Trotz to sit back and say, OK, what do I have? You know, I, I have a full year of watching some of these older players in Andrew Burnett's system. Do we have a dark horse that we can build around. Do we have a legitimate franchise player or, you know, do we, you know, did we sort of underestimate what we have and maybe we need to start thinking about maybe rebuilding a little bit, maybe working towards the future a little bit more aggressively. That seems like where the Nashville Predators are this year. The the only thing I would say is uh, if you have uh, UC Soros and goal, one of, in my mind, one of the three best goalies in the NHL right now. There's always a chance that the Nashville Predators do just well enough to sneak into the playoffs and make things interesting. And when kind of researching stuff for this episode, and even over the summer when I was doing kind of a little Central Division breakdown on all of these teams, you know, and I had been mentioning it with my first couple of questions, it does feel like a little bit of a changing of the guard for the Predators at the same point in time. I would say they exceeded my expectations last year with even how they performed late in the season after making some of those moves and had a pretty darn good season. And there's got to be something said about almost like this pesky predators mantra for something like it seems like something that always happens. And you mentioned with a guy like UC Saros and net, who I firmly believe is one of the best goalies in the NHL as well. And someone who seems to always give the Chicago Blackhawks fricking fits whenever we seem to play him, the guy is just taking up the entire net in there, but somehow is the smallest goalie in the league. I don't understand yeah. it. Um, but it, it does feel like there, there's always one team in the central division. It feels like Nick, who you just can't pinpoint. And uh, do you feel like it could be the Nashville predators? And, and let me ask you this. If the Nashville predators do wind up being that surprise team, what has to go well for them? And if they don't w- wind up being that team, w- what do you think was the result of that? If they want to be that team, they, number one, have to get quality goaltending. But number two, scoring has got to come from somewhere. 
they've lost 76 goals from last year's roster. Uh, and again, that's not just losing, you know, Duchesne and Johansson this off season, but that's, you know, the, the trades, you know, getting rid of Mikhail Granlund and Matthias Eckholm and Nino Niederreiter at the deadline, Tanner Janot. So they have a lot of, you know, I guess lost offense they need to fill. You know, maybe some of that comes from Ryan O'Reilly and Gustav Nyquist. But to me, if the Preds got to, you know, if they want to get to that spot, there has to be somebody else that steps up and kind of carries that load. It's got to be one of the younger players. Um, you know, and so I, I think if the Preds want to have a realistic chance of competing, some of the younger players, Tomasino, Luke Evangelista, Cody Glass, uh, Joachim Kamel, if he makes the team, uh, that's that's sort of a dark horse as well. Those are the people that I think have to, by committee, play well enough and put enough of a dent on the score sheet that the Nashville Predators can start winning some of these games and getting you know into a playoff spot. And then my last question I wanted to ask you too as well, after a, another season like last year, and we kind of had differing opinions when we did this show last year about the direction of the Nashville Predators franchise. And I think you really emphasized to me how much, even though it, it's a, a one of the last spots in the playoff seed, this is a town that really enjoys having competitive hockey and meaningful hockey. And that means a lot to you. Do you still feel that same way right now with the Nashville Predators situation where if they were one of the last teams in, do you feel like that's still a successful season and you move forward from there? Or, or what's the mindset? This year, absolutely. Uh, when you look at who they lost and when you look at them, you know, kind of reshifting the focus of the team uh, to the younger players, then yeah, absolutely. If the Predators can take this team and make a playoff run, um, then that that means that something they needed to go drastically right probably went drastically right. Uh, whether it's the young players stepping up or whether it's Roman Yossi and Philip Forsberg looking like elite NHL players again, like they were just a year ago. So I, I would be very happy with that, Jack. And I know there's maybe some Preds fans who disagree, who would say, you know, we've we've had, we've done the first round playoff exits. Uh, I would rather tank than you know be be knocked out first again. But to me, a playoff berth would say the Preds, even if they get knocked out of the first round again, uh, that would tell me the Preds are moving in a positive direction. Well, as always, Nick, I'm super intrigued to be looking forward to the Central Division, man, because I really do think it's not as deep, not as tough as it's been in the last couple of years. And uh, other than the Colorado Avs, and in my opinion, the Dallas Stars at the top, I think a lot of things for up, are up for grabs. And I don't believe my Chicago Blackhawks are there, but I think it's up for the taking for a team like the Nashville Predators. So wishing you all the best of luck at the start of the season, my friend. Yeah, appreciate it. And you as well. Uh, I know that uh, our two fan bases, maybe <laughs> not big fans of each other, uh, but I, I will say we will certainly be watching, uh, especially when Connor Bedard and those new look Blackhawks uh, hit the ice. Uh, Jack, for our viewers at home, let us know where we can find you. Yeah, absolutely. You can find Locked On Blackhawks 100% free wherever you may be listening to your podcast and on YouTube. If you want to check me out on Twitter, you can find my personal account at Jack Bushman too, right down below. And if you, for some reason, want some more Blackhawks updates along the way, you can find the show at capital L capital O underscore Blackhawks. But Nick, I'll tell you what, you know, if there's hatred between uh, the Blackhawks fans and Predators fans at their peak, that means we're probably both playing some really good hockey. And I know uh, we both would like for our teams to be doing that again. So hopefully the rivalry can can spark back up to uh, what, what it was a couple of years ago when we met in the playoffs. Yeah, amen to that. Uh, it's always uh, exciting when both these teams are firing at all cylinders. Uh, for your viewers, you can listen to Lockdown Predators every day, wherever you get your podcast. Uh, you can also follow my work at PenaltyBoxRadio.com or follow me on Twitter at LO underscore Predators. Uh, or my personal Twitter at underscore NS Morgan. That's going to do it for us on today's crossover between the Lockdown Predators and Lockdown Blackhawks. Thanks for making us your first listen of the day. Both of us will have new shows later this week. Stay tuned.